I am Ian and we are in El Portal. This is a follow-up video to one that we recorded about three months ago that was very impromptu. I was up here in my driveway getting ready to do some welding and all of a sudden you guys showed up and we struck up a conversation and lo and behold, cool video. And I did not know who you were, did not know about the channel. Um, and so during the time I shared a lot of information that is contextual, um, very much things that you can read about in books. And uh, your viewers seem to really enjoy it. So we're doing a follow-up video today. And I figured I would share a little bit more on the esoteric mystical side. And um, also invite you in for a more complete tour. And one of the reasons that I am comfortable with doing that is obviously we know each other and the, the content which you are putting forth I feel has great value. And another reason is because uh, my journey with this property may be coming to a conclusion. So I am going to be listing this for sale probably about the time that this video comes out. And if the right person comes along, then we'll see what happens. Not attached to outcome. We'll see, maybe end up keeping it, maybe not. One of the things that I've learned is that the gifts that I have received being here, uh, as amazing as they are, the continuation of that and the exploration of that requires a certain level of insulation that is not available here. So let's go for a tour. Welcome to Florida, baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. So in the last video, the focus was around the cave and El Portal having the portal of the cave. Maybe. For me, this has always been the portal. This is the Tequesta Burial Mound. The highest, second highest elevation was the highest elevation in all of Miami at one point. And it has some things in common with a lot of ancient sites. So number one, high elevation. Uh, number two, a place that was very well respected and apparently guarded. And also people were buried here. The other is that it is built over porous earth, meaning oolite, which is what we have here with water running through. So at some point I was really into trying to understand what was going on with a lot of the, the ancient sites in the world and really going there and tuning into them and, and why these things were uh, in common, why, they, why a lot of these sites had these things in common. And I came across something at one point that was a photograph that a tourist took in Mexico and they were trying to capture lightning striking and a pyramid was in the background and I'll, I'll give you this picture and they were actually able to capture the moment that lightning struck and there's a beam of light shooting out the top of the pyramid so I was thinking that's really an interesting thing um, what's going on here and that also kind of coincided with looking at the, the Giza Pyramid and someone that had a really interesting take on what it is as far as potentially machinery. And so the, the Nile flows with water underneath and the water creates an electromagnetic or electrostatic charge which through physics and so on and so forth creates certain 
um, combustions on a very small scale which go through chambers and make things resonate and so on and so forth. So anyways, whether or not you believe that or I do or not, I thought it interesting that these sites have some sort of an energetical flow to them. So if energy is encapsulated in the earth and there are areas where the energy penetrates either up or down, maybe this would be one of those. And so I started tuning into that based on some experiences that I was having here. So I'll share some of those stories and I'll share them from a place that I want to make it clear that this video is not about me, it's more about the land and hopefully I can offer some entertaining content that also has value, maybe some things that you do or don't know, and hopefully there's some takeaways. Uh, in addition to there being sites on the earth that are potentially portals, I also believe that our individual bodies are portals. And if you go back and you research kind of the iconography of a lot of the ancient cultures, it seems like that's what they're trying to communicate to us. So this Kundalini awakening, which would be in Indian context, the Uraeus, which would be in the Egyptian, you kind of see these two snakes coming out of the head. So really what, uh, as far as I understand, they're, they're talking about is unlocking dormant energy, which is in the sacrum of the body and having that activated and light up the different energy centers within the body and therefore connect you into a larger context of an energy form. So that in conjunction with places that are also doing that, in my experience, is that uh, things get amplified. And so there's an interesting diagram I came across from the 1800s, which kind of illustrates what's going on with the flow of energy through the human form. And so, in the sense of trying to understand what kundalini energy and unlocking is, I've been on a path for a couple decades. And right here at this moment, at this, not at this moment, at this particular location, I had many experiences, but one which was particularly, let's say, physically violent, where I absolutely felt something explode within my physical form. And since then, I have not been the same. And I have the ability to tune into things uh, in a deeper, more rich way, which is amazing, and I'm absolutely humbled to to have and to share with other people. So kind of a context of some of the, the, sh the stories of this property are in relation to that and what that has shifted in my physiology and that which I share with other people. So again, I'm super humble and I offer any of this just for, for purely the sake of being of assistance to anyone else. So one of the ways that I work with people is by tuning into different plants that are available here in nature. And one of the initial experiences I had on this property while doing that was having communication with the energy of what is here. Uh, obviously there are thousands of Tequesta buried right here, um, of all accounts that we know. And so you would think that whatever that energy is would be absorbed into what is here and that being the trees is kind of the thing that that really has been my most direct con connection with it so one particular example of that is there was a very clear communication to me that this property has this land has always had guardians and i was spoken to and i don't know how to really describe this but it was clear as someone speaking, as me speaking to you right now, someone asked me, um, will you be a guardian of this land? Of which I was like, I don't, I don't know what the heck is going on and like, what does that mean and whatever, but like, okay, like I'll, I'll do that, sure. Like, what is that, okay. And then the, what I received was, okay, you will be rewarded for that. You, you will learn many aspects of how the, the more finite fabric of reality works. And so many years of that unfolding is really what I've been tuning into here. And so I'm gonna share a few stories with different people that I've encountered and different people that, I've, that have come into my circle that I have um, assisted with 
various forms of energy work. And um, one of them will start right here. I was actually really interested in Wim Hof's breathing methods. And I had two other people with me and we were in a catalyzed entheogenic state and really attempting to understand how the combustion of breath and oxygen in the physical form works on a deeper level. So we were very much in tune with that. And we were synchronistically breathing together and touching fingertips and we were able to create some sort of a electrical collective charge within us. And all of a sudden this entire mound was like a bubble that was encapsulated. And the street that you see, there was this kind of clear energy that was just moving and spinning, spinning around. And the sensation was of complete timelessness. And you could hear every little crackle and crisp, like twig or leaf just moving and within the space and everything out of it was in a completely different realm. So, so we were absolutely in our own environment and the two people that are with the people that I respect very much and are not, you know, nobody's trying to make up any stories and we looked at each other and we were all like, are, are you like, and we were all just jaws on the floor. Like, I can't believe we're all experiencing this simultaneously. And all I can say is that was one of the first and clearest understandings that this truly is a portal that is a energy center within itself of which many intentional aspects of tuning into the universe can be achieved. So these Ulite steps here possibly were from the Spanish mission. And again, it's pretty interesting that the Spanish were interested here. Why? I don't know. Why did they pick this location? Was it to convert the Tequesta through colonialism? Was there something else here? I don't know. As we said previously, there were freshwater springs all over this property. And the, the work that you've done around Fountain of Youth is pretty interesting, so maybe there's something to tune into there. So another experience that I had that was kind of similar and neat to the, the, the bubble timelessness on the mound was actually walking down the path of this property. And so what I actually experienced was the expansion of time and there were two other people here and each person was actually operating in their own time speed simultaneously. And the, the whole thing exploded to a point where I was able to understand the mechanism of time on a, a deeper level. And it's, it's very, very much in a realm of synesthesia, but I'll try to, to explain it in maybe a way that makes sense. So if you think of a, a camera wall where there's individual frames that are being run through a projector and we watch a movie, very much that is the sense of what is unfolding or happening in this particular reality is, as I understand it. And so in the expansion and slowing down of that, there are these individual moments and each one of those moments has a different signature of the energy that is present at that time. And the interaction between people has different frequencies in the way that they, they interact. So there are ways that you can actually retro retrospectively go into those timelines and almost see them as if they're like hanging or linear is kind of or like a horizontal and linear way is how I see them. And you can enter into those spaces to actually find those particular frames where there may be some sort of energy that is encapsulated or trapped that is not of service to ourselves. So they're being held in our body as a container, which ultimately manifests into disease. So anyways, we can go into those and we can extract them. And this is very much along the lines of um, various forms of healing and Reiki and so on and so forth. So anyways, the experience was kind of showing how all of that is happening, but each person is in their own sort of projection and reception state 
simultaneously at different speeds interacting within their own sort of movie that is all overlaying each other's movies. So kind of like a being that's in a simulation suit, like the artwork that I have inside. And everyone is kind of sitting behind the scenes of some of the that are playing with one another. And they each have their own sort of meter of a clock ticking. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but uh, understanding on a deeper level and how to work with it is kind of, that, this is where that unfolded. And I've been able to share actually entering into others energy fields in the sense of spontaneous healing whereas i as the being of ian is just a conduit so i just want to make sure that it's not me i'm not trying to take any accountability or credit for that i'm just uh, my particular vessel of which i am assigned has the ability to tune in and be of service in that so that was another kind of fun one that happened particularly right here within the portal. So the burial mound, which is right behind us, is the second highest elevation in all of Miami-Dade County. And then there's about a 15 foot slope down to the river. So when you're standing up here, you're actually looking over the roof of the house. And as we come down, you can kind of see how that transition happens. So yes, there's actually elevation in South Florida. As we come down, here is the famous Tequesta Cave. And yes, this is on private property. You can actually own it, supposedly. So as we move on from the cave, keep going down this little pathway, and we come to this amazing oak tree that is 16 feet in circumference. Um, this was the one that we mentioned in the other video as having the ceremonial dolphin skull buried at the base of it, and the Smithsonian apparently did a core sample test and said it was somewhere around five or 600 years old. There are four royal palms on the property, and there are many layers of tree canopy here, so it's always about 10 degrees cooler than anywhere else in Miami. So as we come down, we get to the Little River. A lot of amazing wildlife here. Manatees, many birds. El Portal is a bird sanctuary. Look, there's iguanas right here. <laughs> So as I mentioned in the last video, the Tequesta women and children were apparently on the south side of rivers in their habitat locations. So this area over here has um, a, lot of, a lot of history and apparently a lot of um, items have been found there. And then this side here was more of the males. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this land has communicated that it's always had guardians. So two of those that I am aware of 
previous to me coming to this land was the next door neighbor and then another neighbor that was up at the top. Um, that particular gentleman was kind of an old hippie, very smart fellow, and um, the, the frequency of mushrooms was something that both of them were interested in. And um, this particular one actually had brewed a tea one day for me with an intention. And um, I don't think that he had any idea of the dosage of what, what the potency was <laughs> for it. And I was kind of naive to it and just open as well. But anyways, um, if you've ever experienced that particular frequency, it's, uh, it can be pretty, pretty expansive. So my experience with the tea that he made for me was being here on the dock and having an overwhelming sense of being pulled out of my body and in very much uh, a typical sense of ego death and, and feeling like things were not right i'm dying this is not okay what do i do now where that that place where people you know go sideways and maybe have what some people might say is a bad trip i very much had the awareness and the preparation to know to just surrender so I did that. And so I was literally sprawled out on this dock, drooling into the river and speaking out loud, I release, take me. And after a few moments, I literally popped out of my body and was looking down. And it was the first time I ever experienced anything like that. And it was so transformational to know that we are consciousness that cannot die can never die. We're just temporarily in these bodies and to be outside of them, seeing them and then come back into them in a, a near-death experience and an ego death was one of the most amazing things that I can say I've experienced in my life and I'm so grateful for. And there's no way for, for me to convince this to anyone, not that I'm trying or anything along those lines, but I, I, I wish that everyone has the opportunity to experience that because your depth and appreciation for being here and knowing that everything's okay is something that will shift you moving forward forever. So for whatever it's worth, that was another interesting thing that happened here. So the other guardian that I mentioned that lived next door previously shared a story with me and there are a few different people that have corroborated this. He met a psychic by the name of uh, Jean-Marie Antoinette. Apparently she is a psychic that is well respected and worked uh, with the police department of Fort Lauderdale for many years and on different cases. and. And um, she came to the property and this gentleman and one of his friends who actually knew her uh, had had many experiences and encounters here and so they brought her in to see if she was able to tune into anything and I will read the account of what she actually wrote in a book that was published of her visit here so let me go ahead and pull this up. I tried to remember the session in the Indian portal. It had been it a had long, been time, long ago. time ago. It, it seems, seems like, like another, another lifetime. lifetime. We had met at his friend's house in the Miami River in an old part of town called El Portal, the portal. On the property there was an Indian burial ground and a cave. The only one I knew existed in Miami. His friend David had done some excavating on the grounds. He was very knowledgeable about archeology span and the indigenous people of the area. For that matter, he was knowledgeable about a lot of things, very spiritually inclined. I was invited into the cave to see if I could shed some light on the former inhabitants. As soon as I walked into his house, I felt her, a young girl filled with such sadness. I felt a horrible emptiness. I crossed my arms around my aching breast and held onto my shoulders. I nearly began to cry. I walked out of the house onto the edge of the river. It was overwhelming. Victor and his friend stood behind me, aware of what was happening, but not sure of what to do about it. The girl, I said, finally breaking through her hold. This poor girl, she's Indian. She lost her child. There's so much grief. She says her child is here, but they wouldn't let her see him. 
She doesn't know why. She keeps coming back looking for her child. David looked at Victor. You didn't tell her anything about this place, did you? No, nothing except about the cave, he said. The neighbors claim this house has been haunted for years now, David said. I don't know how many times that same woman has appeared. She's always walking around looking for something. They all described her as a young Indian girl. Well, they're right. She's definitely here, I said, feeling another wave of emotion sweeping through me. Is there something we should do for her? Victor asked. She needs to understand what happened. I don't know who she's talking about. I don't really understand, I said. Are you up to sitting in the cave for a while, David asked? Or would you rather come in, relax, and have something cold to drink? You tell me what works best for you. No, thank you for the offer, I said, but I'm fine. I think I'd like to see the cave. Victor grabbed a blanket and two bottles of water from the ledge beside us. It's hot in there, and I thought you might like something to sit on. Good idea, David said. I'm going in to get some water and a few candles. You two go ahead and I'll meet you inside. Victor walked with me over some coral rocks into the entrance of the cave. It was set into what looked like layers of river rock. The roots of huge trees were growing around the whole space. It reminded me of the pyramids of Mexico with those roots growing over everything in the jungle, except this cave was a miniature. The entrance stepped down into three carved stairs and onto an earthen floor. There were a few carved out niches where candles had been placed recently. There was enough space for the three of us to sit comfortably. I was amazed that this existed in Miami. I had never seen anything like it before. David came right behind us and lit the candles. Now you tell us whatever you need here, if we should talk, meditate, be still or be quiet, whatever. Oh, don't worry about it. I just need to feel things for a minute. Talking doesn't bother me. Try not to move around too much though. Movement does throw me off sometimes. The two of them talked for a minute and I started to feel another presence. This one was male and he definitely was not out of control. He was an older man, tall, bronze skinned and very strong. There was something dignified about his face. He was regal looking. He came in and sat down to talk with me. He was not too thrilled to speak to me at first. He seemed annoyed with my being there. The other two didn't seem to bother him, only me. I tried to communicate with him without words. He was letting me know that he did not appreciate my being a woman, but since I was older and a shaman like himself, he would tolerate it. He told me he was the guardian of the burial grounds and that some pesky woman coming over and upsetting his warriors. I'm not sure how, but I understood what he meant. He didn't want any women of childbearing years around because he thought it distracted the spirits of the warriors over whom he stood guard. Evidently, he felt their sexual attraction might somehow jeopardize the focus of his warriors. I wasn't sure what they were supposed to be focusing on, but he felt it was a very serious duty. He said he had tried to talk to David, but David didn't seem to hear him. I told him he was still learning, that he really wanted to talk to him, but he didn't know how yet. He seemed satisfied with that and looked over to him. Then he began telling me a few things he wanted to convey to David, things that he needed to do there. He gave him some encouragement regarding a few things on which he had been working. David knew to what he was referring, I did not. Then the shaman told him there was some things that needed to be changed on the land. I don't remember it all, too many details, but he did ask him what he had done with the plants that had grown down by the river, some bushes with red berries. He told him he would talk to him some more if he made some kind of drink with the plants and brought it to him next time. David knew of the bushes, but I had to ask him how to make the drink. He was very cooperative and told me how. That's really all I remember of the day. David had called me later telling me he found a book describing the same drink from the berries. He was making the drink and wanted me to come back and talk to him again. But I never made it back. I felt bad for the poor Indian girl. I should have gone back and tried to explain to her why the shaman kept chasing her away. They must have taken her child there when he died. She didn't understand why she couldn't come in. For that matter, neither did I, not completely. She had been lactating and for some reason that really seemed to set the old Indian man off. 
These were the same people that built the circle, and it had been discovered right after the visit. I don't, I don't know, know if, if or, or what, what the, connection. the connection might have been, but Victor and David seemed to think that there was something of it. So, first time I read this was actually two days ago because the son of this psychic actually posted in the comments of the first video that we did. And he said, I know this place, I remember my mother speaking of it, and I'm so grateful, paraphrasing, uh, she passed away this year, and, and thank you for, for bringing this information forward. So I actually reached out to him, um, his name is Joel, and he's a wonderful person, that, and very happy to share information about his mother. So, um, so thank you, Joel, for, for sharing this. Um, there's a couple of interesting things that I find about that story. So one is the, that the, apparently the woman that was inconsolable was not allowed to be around the mound. So that kind of corroborates the females being on the other side, the south side of the rivers and the males being on the north. The other. And I was told that the Tequesta women and children were primarily on the south side here and then the males were on the north side here. The other is the, the guardianship of the mound and that there is a very strong presence, which not just this one, but many people that have come to the property have claimed to have encountered, myself including. And, and that's curious to me, what are, they, what are they protecting? What is that? Is it a burial mound? Is there more there? Is, is there an energy force? Is there a portal? Is there something? I, I don't pretend to know, but uh, I will say that there, in my experiences, what is present here is very, very dense, concentrated, and powerful, and very much enjoys communicating. And, um, and another interesting aspect is this story was actually told to me by the, the gentleman that lived next door that, was, uh, that I mentioned was one of the guardians. So the, the part about the, the red berries, what he told me is after this woman left that day, he went into his home and, um, and he was very much uh, a plant enthusiast. He opened up an encyclopedia, so apparently a large book that he had, and the moment that he started to open it, he said he felt a force come and just smash it out of his hand. The book went crashing to the floor and he was very startled by this. And when he looked, it, it was open to the page of Elixir Vomitoria, which is Yapon Pali. And turns out that Yapon was a holly that grew in the area that was condensed down by brewing and brewing and brewing into basically, uh, you may say, an ayahuasca analog. So it was, it was the Tequesta's power plant. It was a super high concentration of caffeine that was referred to as the black drink. And so they would ingest this and they would have basically projectile vomit of, of whatever was within their form, their container that they had absorbed that was not serving them. So, so very much similar to what the Peruvian ayahuascaros and shamans uh, work with. So the fact that that whole unfolding that these people apparently didn't know any of that history and then put it together and then shared it later is, is pretty interesting. And he did end up planting uh, Yapon on the property, which I believe is probably still there. Um, so one of the things that's, that I believe is present here that has been communicated to me by other people that I respect and trust is that, uh, that there's a presence of a Heoki energy. And from what has been explained to me and what I understand is um, Heoki is a lineage or a, a way of, it's a trajectory of like a trickster energy. Um, it's a way to teach through kind of meddling. And so um, many people have communicated that they feel an energy of like messing with, like attempting to mess stuff up and to like really just 
get in there and like take over things in a way to teach lessons, but to like make things confusing and really messy. And so um, a lot of the cultures that from what I, a lot of the tribes from what I understand would actually place a Heoki energy on sacred sites to protect the site. And so there was a, a point in the history of, of my history with this property where I was teaching and I was working with groups and different entheogens and it just was too much to manage. It was too much to oversee because um, the what's here is, t is too intense, it's too powerful. People were just full on channeling all the time and it was just like one thing running off this direction, one thing running off that direction and me attempting to, to hold a container and to really have people in a healing space was is becoming more and more clear that that was not something that's really conducive to the energy that's here. So I really step back and, you know, I, I am aware that that energy is here and it's probably present all the time in all of our, all of our lives. But uh, one person that kind of corroborated that was uh, a Zuni elder that passed away this past year that I, I came to know. Um, his name was uh, Clifford Mahoney and he, uh, he probably, well, if you're into things like ancient aliens and different documentaries where um, the Zuni are really kind of talking about how they're connected into the the star beings. Um, he was showcased in a lot of that. So beautiful, beautiful being, and um, we'll miss him. And uh, learned a lot from him. And and uh, yeah, I think I have some photos I'll share of him here on the property. So, anyways, hokey trickster spirit energy, always a thing to be aware of and to uh, to learn from. So. All right, so here's another another little story. Um, so I was asked to support someone who was in the inner circle of um, something that you would know is very televised and a very kind of scandalous ring of sexual exploitation. Um, I'll leave it at that. So, anyways. Um, I was attempting to understand how to be of best service to to this particular person, and um, I did some preparation and really went and and opened up portals and was able to to get to a place to to receive the information that was going to be helpful. So, what I learned is that. Um, the veil that separates this 3D reality and many other layers that are there. Um, the one that I kind of mentioned as I popped out of my body and was there and being able to, to look back down and, and have the awareness. Uh, the place where when we, when we leave the body, when we pass, we're, is one of the layers where we're possible, possibly able to, to navigate and uh, many of the layers. Um, that within that space that is also here and maybe just not ways that we are able to perceive with the particular sensory organs of the vehicles that we're encapsulated in right now. Um, there are energy forms that are beings, entities, patterns, um, various things um, embodied, not, not embodied, sometimes embodied, and um, you know, without trying to pretend like I understand it, I was on the other side of the veil of the 3D and one of these energy forms let, allowed me to go along for a ride with it, of which I walked into someone else's body and was able, I was witnessing interacting with another person in another 3D space with those beings not aware of what was going on. but being in a space where energy was able to be received and absorbed from that. And so the the showing and the education of what that was by that energy spirit teacher, whatever it may be, really unfolded in a way that was like seeing the physical form as a as a battery source all of our vitality is held within us. And so in the sacrum, which is the closest to our sexual organs, is where that energy source is sprouted from. And then it spins and it kind of envelops us. And so behind the veil, we are these multidimensional 
beings that are temporarily in form. And so when we're out and we are perhaps in interacting with those that are not in form, they have the ability to penetrate in to use our battery sources for their own benefit. And sometimes this can be mutually agreed upon and sometimes not. Um, and this really gets into channeling and predatory energy feeding and things of this nature. So um, you know, I don't want to sound all crazy and, and like get people scared or things of that nature, but, but what I believe is that there are patterns of energy that are able to feed off of other energy sources and host with other beings. And so in the understanding of how that mechanism works, brings the awareness of, okay, the value is having a vibration of, of oneself which is as high and pure as possible to know the difference. So things like alcohol brings our vibration down, things like certain um, emotions, um, anger and sadness and, and grief and shame and guilt, all these things really bring that battery source down which our awareness or our consciousness diminishes which allows something else to also utilize our physical form. And so the big takeaway from it, um, and I'm not going to go into how I actually was able to share value with someone else, but with that particular being, but, but is to really be able to understand what, what brings you vitality. What is the joy in your life? What is, what is really tuning into the golden rule with empathy, with love and, and connecting uh, with beings? And if there is any trauma in your field, what it, what it looks like to really find clarity of that and to be able to, to break those ties of what may be there. So that was what I was experiencing and feeling and and it all kind of ties into another aspect of bringing our energy up to a high vibration um, which is with another being that I had so so I'll share kind of another story is um, my intention at one point was to use a particular catalyst to go in and to really understand food and how our physical form functions with particular different types of food with meat with seafood, with uh, dairy, with vegetables, with fruits, and in that particular state, really being in physical form and connected to other realms, I was able to open up a place of ultimate synesthesia where all of my senses really captured what the vibrational frequency, the essence, the energy level, in measurable ways of each food. And without really getting into too much, what I can say is fruit is exponentially by far the highest frequency, particularly citrus. Um, so when I tuned into that and I said, this is absolutely unbelievable what I'm experiencing here, who else knows about this? I went on a search and search and search and I came across a gentleman by the name of Dr. Robert Morse, who you may have heard of. His story is that he nourished himself on only Florida navel oranges for six months and his state of being and consciousness healed itself, rectified itself and was able to open into a space of clarity and synesthesia ultimately that he therefore became unbelievably healthy and shared this information through a form of detoxification and has since brought I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people back from the basically being sent home to die to being functional people again. So um, another interesting person to look into in that sense is Dr. Robert Morse, also here in Florida. So yeah, testament to a fruit diet which ever since that moment of biting into that citrus orange in like a super high frequency catalyzed state and it just went and I could feel the electricity just completely wash through my body like since then fruit has basically been the main staple of what I eat like and for for a long time probably many years it was only fruit but uh, you know 
some vegan and vegetarian things over the years and, and I probably need to go back and do a little more citrus detox at this point. You know, it's always a, an up and down road. But anyways, that really shifted me into a, a higher state of beingness and consciousness. And um, so that maybe takes us to another little story. So I was working with a gentleman who had a very challenging part of his life was very challenging growing up he was really uh, he had some pretty serious trauma and um, he's an amazing being that was able to overcome that to really get to know himself and be of service to others um, and the verification of that is he's actually the personal coach of one of the greatest sports uh, players that that uh, you know I'm not gonna name names but amazing guy anyways we were doing some work together and he had done all of this real uh 3d amazing content on himself and really gone into the depths there and so when we opened up the space had energy fields overlap one of the things that happened at that moment is things that were very dark became uh available to be released and so in kind of guiding him through this process these things were up and out and he was free of it and he he really had a transformation and um, i believe he still you know really holds it into high regard this day so uh, at that point in my life i was doing multiple sessions and that was one of three sessions that i did that particular day the third one in the evening i was completely wiped out and it was like more uh, some friends and we were kind of here to to tune into more of a channeling aspect to try to understand a little bit deeper the energies that are here on the property but i was in a state that i was really just like physically done and exhausted and energetically like annihilated Anyways, I was inside, everyone else was outside, and everyone kind of erupted, I think there were three or four people, and was like scattering and running around the property, and, and I was in here by myself, and they came in, and I was like, what, what is going on, like, what, what's up? And simultaneously, I was feeling something like, it was almost like it was gnawing at me, or like trying to get in, into my form, of which I was like, it's okay, not cool, like, that's not happening. And so they each came in their own accord from different parts of the property and were telling a story about how they had encountered some dark energy that was attempting to latch itself to them. And uh, there was one female and there were a few males and the energy only wanted to be attached to males. And this whole thing went on for like two or three hours and they were literally like, the, like freaking out about it and the woman that was there because it wasn't interested in her was like kind of the the fender off of of this thing and ultimately it you know as they described it went into the water and it, it was able to 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 find its way elsewhere because it did not want to it did not want to go back to source back to light it just wanted to host and feed off of someone so i i really believe that that energy whatever it is i'm not saying that it had some sort of a consciousness or anything it just it, it i truly believe that it was the darkness that was from the experience that this gentleman had had earlier in his life that was unlocked and then it was here on the property and we dealt with it several hours later and so it was one of those experiences where there are multiple people that are corroborating from different angles with different perspectives and all having things come together and really have it be one one unified story so you know it was an interesting one so ever since that experience that i had on the mound which is several experiences but the one main unlocking of the the kundalini energy which transformed my consciousness and beingness and how I function in the world. Um, one of those things is that I feel that I am a, a conscious channel, meaning that there are other forms of energy that I, can, uh, I will allow to merge with my physical form so that they can interact through me with the intention of being of service to others here. And 
that is something that I feel I am just a conduit to and that I am I have set the intention to the universe that I am of service to the change makers in the world and ever since I did that years ago I've been blessed with many amazing relationships just unbelievably successful intelligent um, conscious just wonderful people and people that have some ability to to shift on a collective way that is that is um, for the betterment of the trajectory where we're going and um, and so that's something that I'm, I'm really grateful for and I don't really put myself out there just um, people tend to find me for for whatever reason somehow and I, I don't pretend to understand how all of that works behind the scenes but all of that being in context um, having the ability to have other forms of consciousness merge with mine in a particular plane and so I would describe this as the being of Ian is here and then there are other forms that can merge which are also individual and then of course I as the being of Ian know that I'm just playing a character and I'm operating on a much level larger level of the we the collective which I know that I'm speaking to a version of myself as are you as it is all this beautiful system of which we don't remember that we all are consciousness experiencing itself and playing anyways one of those events that has reoccurred is with a particular energy form here on the property and I believe that that is probably the chief that many people have spoken about that I've encountered and having a trans channel come one time which is uh, described as a person who also allows other forms to enter their body and to function through their body however they completely check out uh, I have encountered I have interacted with this energy and it's shared many interesting things with me and so it's been very interesting to have that one-on-one -on -one, as well as feel that it often is there with me and in just a conduit fashion I have witnessed and experienced how the the depth of knowledge and wisdom and articulation of what is behind the veil can penetrate through to be of service for others and truly have remarkable spontaneous healing lasting healing insights wonderful transitions and shifts for for people to really enjoy life in a deeper much more fulfilling way um, so one of these times which I believe was that particular energy um, and this is something that happens to me often is when I'll open those those channels there's disembodied consciousness that is in that location and I experience the death of what that was in some sort of a way that it is released and it returns back to the light and is no longer in some sort of like purgatory realm so what I experienced on this particular event that I'm going to tune into was being a very well-respected leader of a tribe and being essentially the last holder of a particular set of wisdom and information and knowledge that we maybe would say is um, shamanism but probably to a much greater depth and I experienced the that particular beings death and uh, I was laying on my back and it was a cutting of the throat and the the essence of what it was was no ill thought or no anger towards the person that was doing it or the the kind of the conquering force that had come to really take over the the land and the people but really a sadness in knowing that that as that death that being the the lineage of knowledge was to be lost and it was incredibly painful and heartbreaking to experience that and to to pass beyond knowing that the, like that was the end of an era and without it the ability to protect the people and the ability 
for the traditions in a, in a certain depth would no longer be able to continue. And um, later I was reading accounts uh, of the Tequesta and the St. Anne's mission that was set up here on the property and it was, um, it was, there was an account that basically said the chief's brother had been uh, basically murdered by the missions. Uh, supposedly they were Spanish missions and French Huguenots and there was some sort of event and they murdered the chief's brother and like that set off a chain of reactions. So I don't know if that was what I was tuning into or later that became the, the same ill fate of one of the, the chiefs or not. But the experience of what I felt was as real as you and me here, like the every century um, stimulation was there. The smell, the like the feel, the the emotions, the like just the awareness, the 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 consciousness of being that person was there. And um, and so, anyways, that's something that's possible, and that's something that if you do so, decide to tune in and, and kind of make yourself available with intention that is pure, that you can assist not only others here but in other realms. So. I share that just for whatever value you may find from it. So when I bought this property, I was 33 and it was in a time in my life when I owned a pretty high-end construction company and wanted to step away from the chaos and create something special for myself. So lots of synchronistic events led me here and led me to this old pump house that was not very nice and for many years I have been polishing it up and making it a little hidden gem. So I went in. So welcome to my little sanctuary. So as I started to allude to before, I've learned many things being in this land, on this land, with this land. And this property is a bit of a reflection of that, some of the artwork that's here and materials used and just, you know, the imprint that it's had on me and me on it.
So I've included a lot of things from friends that I've met along the way. This is a, a painting by a Peruvian ayahuasquero. Um, he is one of two of the original descendants as far as proteges of Pablo Amaringo, who is known as the kind of the the quintessential visionary artist of South America. And this is one of his largest and most revered paintings, so it's an honor to have that. He is a beautiful soul, and I've enjoyed lots of experiences with him. The interest at all, but this is like a collection of that lineage of art. So one of my favorite things about this property is waking up and feeling like you're in the trees. And so many times there are hawks and falcons and all different types of birds just sitting on these branches peering in the window. So it's a pretty incredible spot. Every single window that you look out, it's just green. So a sanctuary within Miami. I think that's why I stayed in Miami for as long as I did. So my inspiration for this wall was to have kind of fish scaled effects and so this limestone is cut linear and it's knocked with a hammer and then I put in moss to kind of give like a raining down effect. Um, I think at the time it was kind of like the binary code that you see almost like in the Matrix movies where it's kind of falling down. That was sort of the visual inspiration for it. So this bathroom was, um, it was a challenge for myself. Every single tile is a different size and I built a puzzle out of it. And the back wall is an infinity wall. And so when you look into it, you see the items that are placed within it that kind of replicate and go into infinity. Reading on the shower and checking. actually a working fireplace which is pretty neat um, and this, this art is by um, an artist named Cameron Gray in Australia and I always thought that this piece really resonated with the property because it's kind of like rooted in nature yet you have the city right outside and you know a being really connecting in but obviously still being amongst the energy and the craziness of Miami and so that was what I thought same artist did this piece over here. He was kind enough to, to let me print it out and do it wallpaper size, so. The kitchen is really neat because it's almost like being on 
a houseboat or something. So you're, you're cooking literally on the water. The water is 23 inches from these windows. And at one point this was a porch. And so it was enclosed in the exterior of the house, which was coral. I preserved and lit it up and put glass in front of it. It almost has an aquarium effect to it. See the raccoon in there? <laughs> yeah. Raccoons, all different animals. So out here is a little living area. This is one of five different species of bamboo that are on the property. One of the previous owners was big into collecting seeds and traveled the world and he was kind of known for like taking seeds from the Queen's garden and hiding them in his underwear when he would go through customs and planting them here. So it's all sorts of neat things. I at one point I had about 150 different orchids on the property. And there's also a little cottage, office, guest room. So you want to know if I think that Florida is unique or special in any particular way, as obviously this is a channel about Florida. Um, and I can only um, speak to my own experiences here. Um, when I arrived to this property, I was very different than what I am now. I am a much more tuned in, aware, conscious being on many, many accounts. Um, Florida is definitely has a magnetic pull to it. I think it's interesting that this particular spot here has this reoccurring guardianship that keeps coming up. So w what is here? What, what was here? Um, you know, what are, what are the energy centers? What are the things that are here? What are, what are the imprints that were left from the previous cultures? Uh, I don't pretend to know, but, but I can say I have felt great concentrations of energy that move in circular ways, almost like hurricanes, tornadoes, whirlpools, um, that is absolutely present here. And I felt it sync with that, which is also in my body and open into amazing, amazing experiences. Um, this particular land and Florida was on the radar of the Spanish. Why? I don't know. That's, that's another great question. Um, you know, what, what were they interested in? What was it, whatever was being guarded here? I don't know. Um, you know, there, I've, I've done this work in, in many different areas. Um, I've been, I've spent a good bit of time in Mexico, in the Yucatan, um, befriended the the leader of the Mayans that's become a friend um, I have tuned in on top of pyramids and and really felt the energy there and and I feel that that is also similar to signatures that are here more so than other places um, more recently I've been tuning in in the northeast areas the Algonquin um, I'm very much tuned into the Cherokee, of which I have blood, um, in those regions. So everything has a different signature. But Florida, Florida definitely has some vitality to it. There's some, there's some sort of an essence that is like um, uh, very energetic, long-lasting. Um, the, there, are, there are not seasons here like there are in many other parts of the world, and so. The energy is very much on the go all the time, and there's 
not so much that dormant hibernation essence that you you have in other places of this country and, and around the world. Uh, I don't know. I love Florida. I will probably always be rooted in here in some aspect, whether or not I am the the owner or the guardian of this property, or if another one comes along sooner than later. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I feel the, the Abenaki calling, and so I'm going to tune in there one way or the other, and, um, and I'm very grateful for everything that has been unfolded and gifted to me here, and I hope this video is uh, an opportunity for me to honor that, and, uh, and I hope that that has come through with humility and hopefully in a way that adds some value. So again, thank you to Old World Florida and thank you for the opportunity just to, to connect with you.